it's rare to see a game get polarizing reviews from both the critics and the fans. Oftentimes, these kind of games either become cult classics or become severely niche games with very small communities. However, neither of these cases apply to one game, Death Stranding. For many, you either love or hate this game, with the fanbase absolutely adoring this game while those who dislike it are often very critical of the very elements that fans have come to love. Even with generally positive reviews from the critics, it's clear that many of Death Stranding's innovative ideas haven't quite stuck, with some even negatively responding to these fresh elements. That's why this game is so interesting to look at, because it's an example of how fresh game ideas don't always stick with their target audience. It's also an example of situations where many may not have fully played the game before coming to their conclusions, being unable to understand what the game has to offer in its entirety. Due to the relatively slow burn nature of Death Stranding, it can often be a barrier to many to uncover what a treasure this game can really be. For that same reason, it is difficult for many players in the fanbase to bring new players into the fold. Given the criticisms and surface level understanding of the game, many are deterred from really trying out the game, as it can often be somewhat hard to explain all the nuances and why the game is fun. And that brings us here today as we break down why Death Stranding is truly a polarizing masterpiece. Before jumping into the mechanics of the game, it is equally as important to first understand the setting of the game, which much of the later discussion will be based on. Released in 2019, Death Stranding takes place in the Earth's near future, where the mysterious event known as the Death Stranding has thinned the walls between the dead and the living, giving the departed a ticket to the land of the living. These lost souls, known as Beach Things or BTs, become mysterious floating spirits that are stranded on the earthly plane and unable to return to the beach, where the dead go. However, if they come into contact with corpses, they will trigger what are known as void outs, large explosions that annihilate everything in range. It is under these circumstances that many have gone into shelters, isolated from the world around them. It is also because of this kind of isolation that we find the need of porters, people who brave the degradation of timefall to deliver resources and parcels across the landscape from one shelter to the next. We play as Sam Strand, a porter who has the unique ability to repatriate, an ability that allows him to survive otherwise lethal events and return to the land of the living. As a result, Sam gets mixed up with Bridges, a coalition of top US personnel who aim to rebuild America by reconnecting the world through their Carol network, a new technology that takes advantage of the world's new ecosystem. Throughout the journey, Sam is often tasked to deliver certain parcels and cargo to different shelters and enlist the help of their occupants, also known as preppers. As he continues to build the network, Sam also crashes with opposition factions with their own agenda as he attempts to navigate the world. However, not everyone fully agrees with how the story plays out with the game. But now that we've established the major concepts that laid the foundation of the game and its context, we can begin to understand the mechanics and what makes them unique and enjoyable. Possibly one of the biggest points of criticism in the game is the gameplay loop itself. Despite this being one of the most important things the game has to get right, it also isn't too hard to see why this is a contested point. With 15 distinct episodes to tell the story over the course of the game, the first three episodes act as a larger introduction to traversal, the story, as well as the core gameplay loop. In spite of that, many players do not make it past this chapter, with completion rates being under 40% on both the PlayStation and on Steam, suggesting that this loop doesn't necessarily captivate many players. Putting the length of Chapter 3 aside, it is easy for many to classify Death Stranding as a walking simulator. While many argue against it, it is also equally as cliché to say that it is more than a walking simulator, because the early hours of Death Stranding really is about traveling from point A to point B on foot. What makes the gameplay loop interesting actually lies between how one travels between the two points and how one prepares for the long road ahead. It is easy for many to brute force each of their early deliveries, as the opening area is relatively small. However, the game does emphasize preparing for each delivery rather than just rushing out. Specifically, each delivery outlines conditions that need to be met to maintain cargo quality and maximize your delivery score. Things like temperature, damage limits, and other factors help to lay out what Sam must be wary of during his journey and what gear each player should pick to maximize their chances of success. Sam can fabricate any of this gear from the different distro centers, and eventually at any of the preppers. These include vehicles, weapons, as well as backup carriers that help to offset the load that Sam carries. Other gear like ladders and climbing anchors play essential roles in battering the traversal of the diverse landscape, offering easier paths through different biomes, making gear a pivotal part in making each delivery possible and helping Sam to survive. Despite this emphasis on preparation, many see the loop as quickly going stale. This is because many of the advancements in Death Stranding are largely tied to the game's story progressions and through doing standard orders with other preppers. 
Instead of a regular currency, each delivery in the game grants the player a letter grade, which, in turn, provides Sam with a certain amount of likes. But likes are not a concrete form of currency. Unlike most games where money becomes the basis of upgrades and new tech, likes are a way for Sam to forge bonds between characters instead, similar to how one would add heart points in a dating simulator. As the bond goes higher, which is represented through stars, each prepper or distro center will provide new items. These can either be cosmetic or new forms of gear that can aid the player. As this progression is largely tied to story and less about the grind for money, many players may find that the developments of gear to be rather slow. Some preppers do not gain the ability to fabricate gear until much later, making availability of gear more sparse in the early hours, forcing the player to truly value the equipment they have on their backs. Early equipment development may also seem useless or obsolete, like the EX grenades. These grenades, which are made of Sam's bodily fluids, seem useless initially. However, they act more as a bait or distraction rather than an offensive weapon. This is easily lost as the game needs you to test the effects rather than tell you the effects. The same can be said for certain weapons like the sticky gun. With the simple gimmick, many don't like to use the gun as it acts as more of a support equipment rather than an offensive weapon. However, this piece of equipment is still quite helpful for deliveries outside of reach, like from high altitudes or in the waterfall basin, thus making all equipment useful just in many various situations. In fact, the natural gameplay loop with Death Stranding is less about moving from point A to point B, but how to better streamline the process and make each delivery easier than the last. For many players, it will be tough in the early hours, but the introduction of vehicles, PCCs, and roads are all incentives for players to invest and make their lives as a porter much better as the game continues. The issue is that it is quite lengthy to set up many of these systems. Roads require copious amounts of metals and ceramics to build, longer zipline systems also take time, and maintaining and upgrading them are even tougher due to the sheer weight of materials. It is because of that that most players won't be visiting this loop until later into the game. Those who do invest in these systems gain huge quality of life benefits. Both roads and ziplines make it much easier to make deliveries without fear of damage, resulting in higher delivery grading and likes. Longer deliveries also become much less time consuming as long stretches of road like the one between Lake Knot and South Knot become condensed into a single highway. Players can also take on larger consignments without worrying about tripping over every other minute, improving the diversity of deliveries Sam can take on. While the road doesn't connect everything, ziplines further develop that streamlined process, especially in the mountain area. By having ziplines that can easily take you from one prepper to another, mountain area deliveries go from taking 30 minutes to just under 10. As the game progresses and many enter the endgame, each delivery just becomes easier. Knowing how enemies work, being prepared, and having the necessary transport tools make Death Stranding less of a walking simulator and more of a postal simulator. Even so, many find that the improvements in the quality of life in Death Stranding does not offset another major point in the gameplay, and that is the repetitiveness of moving from one point to another. The problem with Death Stranding is that it is very hard for people to compare it to a run-of-the-mill action RPG. There exists a different ecosystem. The gameplay loop is starkly different, and the ultimate goal cannot be condensed into getting stronger to tackle the big boss. While upgrading and improving the craft of deliveries is certainly a good incentive for most players, it is hard for many to see this as more than a walking simulator. It is fair to say that not many continue after the main story, yet the experience during the central plotline does carry enough weight that warrants looking past the gameplay loop. The thing with the mechanics of Death Stranding is that it often throws the player in a perpetual loop of calm and tension. Much like most adventure games going through a similar loop, Death Stranding has a higher emphasis on the calm events instead of the tension. One of the biggest appeals of the world of Death Stranding is simply the beauty and the mystery of this new world. Luscious landscapes and nothing but the ambiance of it create a uniquely calming atmosphere in Death Stranding. The challenges you take in traversing these landscapes add to that beauty, tasking the player to figure out routes and creating new ones across the landscape, be it on a snowy mountain or across the black stained terrain. Despite all this calmness, Death Stranding easily flips between the two extremes, pitting Sam in increasingly tense situations as the journey continues. What initially starts out as a very common experience quickly also turns into learning and adapting to a very harsh environment, with different enemies out to get you if you make a wrong turn. This is only further accented through the story, as Sam often finds himself either calmly making deliveries or stuck amidst battlefields of the dead making for an overall experience that ramps up in intrigue and technicality. In fact, the endgame provides a similar experience for many veteran players. By having many of these systems laid out, many players have upgraded to the hard difficulty, challenging themselves with the Legend of Legends grading for deliveries. Others would prefer roaming the vast expanse and seeing the entire world, embracing and adapting to any hiccups along the way. In that sense, Death Stranding slowly leans away from purely being a walking simulator. While still there in principle, it eventually evolves into an atmospheric game, enjoying the world around you. Simultaneously, it also provides the means to tackle new challenges and take on previously impossible feats, an incentive that improves the overall endgame experience. 
While those who initially start up Death Stranding may find it slow and boring, the eventuality of the game's ecosystem is that there is still more left to be discovered. All the new gear and the new regions build upon the mystery and intrigue of the world, but it requires the patience of players who may not have the convenience of these systems, which is what makes it very easy for others to drop out early on. If the game needs a warning for anything, it will likely be for its implementation of BTs, and the larger emphasis on stealth in the early hours of the game. While Death Stranding's main gameplay loop is mainly about deliveries, the addition of stealth and combat in between each delivery adds point of tension, and in some cases, horror. Most of these threats are introduced at the very beginning of the game. BTs are unveiled in the opening sequence with Igor, while mules are present early on the road towards the distribution center west of Capital Knot City. Both types of enemies pose different threats to Sam and to the cargo that he carries. These threats make the terrain the least of Sam's worries with each delivery. Strong equipment and taking movement slow will often get Sam past the worst of terrain, with the real challenge being how to best escape each threat with the cargo still safely stuck on Sam's back. As the game continues, players will learn more about how each threat behaves, as well as the gear they can bring to effectively bring them down. Mules are former porters who have slowly gone mad, resulting in them being obsessed with deliveries. This means that they like to actively steal and hoard cargo from other porters to satisfy their compulsive need to do so. However, they are also quite territorial, bearing arms against anyone who steps into their territory, and will react aggressively if anyone is carrying cargo into their territory. If Sam strays into their area, their beacon lights up, marking your location within their territory, painting a target on Sam's back. Initially armed with spears, being hit by too many of them results in Sam falling unconscious and losing his cargo. This gets worse as time goes on as many of these mules have allied with homo demons and would be armed with firearms, putting Sam at risk of death. In the early hours, Sam is largely underprepared, having only his two fists and his strand as offensive weapons. This forces many players to either hide in tall grass and tie up unsuspecting mules or run quickly in and out of enemy camps. The alternative to stealth is a long dragged out fight with the mules, often being extreme challenges as they quickly gang up and incapacitate Sam. As the game progresses, gear like weapons and armor are introduced to Sam. Guns are not introduced until the player is roughly 10 hours into the game. These weapons are lethal at first, giving Sam the option to kill mules. Despite that, there is a massive trade off for killing mules, with players having to correctly dispose of the bodies to avoid void outs, as dead mules become BTs and come into contact with corpses. This places players in an awkward area, where weapons must be carefully used to negate any of the risks that killing brings. As time goes on, Sam does come into more variations of this gear, obtaining not only non-lethal variants, but also BT variants which help Sam in any form of combat. Having non-lethal weapons also allows Sam to be more free to tackle mule camps and human threats, avoiding many of the issues that lethal weapons brought during the mid-game. The addition of armor further helps Sam to tank a lot of damage, making exploration and combat more streamlined in the long run. The other major threat are the BTs, the physical form of humans who have returned from the dead as a result of the Death Stranding. They represent the biggest threat as a result from the Death Stranding, being able to drag unsuspecting people into black tar and remove them from the earthly plane. These souls do not have eyes, so they react to any threats based on sound, making stealth easier. But just because they cannot see doesn't mean they're not as deadly as mules because BTs are even more fatal and aggressive. While directly running away and using vehicles seems like an efficient solution at first, the ever-changing landscape in Death Stranding also means that it isn't always possible to just run away. Instead, the game pushes most players to strategically maneuver through BT territory. By crouching and holding Sam's breath when close to a BT, most players are able to move through enemy territory, making these sequences essentially stealth missions. This is often the safer option, as being caught by a BT can either result in tackling the BT mini-bosses or even create void outs, resulting in substantial damage to the cargo on Sam's back and temporarily changing the landscape for the worse. This holds especially true for mountainous areas, which are often hard to traverse on vehicles, forcing a slower trek on foot and having to brave the terror of the BTs. Even with the initial push on stealth, Death Stranding does eventually provide the means of offense to Sam against the BTs. The blood-based semantic weapons become the core part of Sam's fight against larger BTs, ensuring safety and opening up the possibility of clearing the BT territory before proceeding. In the early hours, these weapons take the form of hematic grenades, chock full of Sam's blood. Because it is a hematic weapon, each use consumes part of Sam's blood or health. That means any usage of hematic rounds comes with a trade-off, forcing players to strategically take down BTs rather than hunting down every last one. The inclusion of more rapid-fire weapons doesn't fully alleviate the risk either, as each weapon has a varying degree of damage against the BTs. Grenades are largely one hit but only kills one or two BTs, 
while the AR needs almost a full magazine to take them down. This makes almost all hematic weapons more strategic than purely offensive, as players must consider both their distance with the BT and whether or not they have sufficient firepower to sever their bond. Failure to do so results in the BT chasing after you, potentially resulting in a hostile encounter and the destruction of cargo. Much like the developments of equipment, many weapons are tied to story progression, meaning it takes a while for Sam to be in full combat formation. In fact, it is in the endgame that many players will finally find the ultimate weapon, the HG weapons. These variations appear after helping out Peter Engler, providing the players with a weapon that offset many of the initial risk with these weapons. Being Kyrelian based rather than Hematic, HG weapons do substantially more damage against BTs and minibosses. The unlocking of the Kyrelian cuff during the story also maximizes Sam's lethality in BT territory, providing the option to directly cut the connection of the BT at the expense of BB's stability. Even with all these improvements to Sam's survivability in the long run, the mechanics still remain divisive to some. Because it is almost impossible to do a delivery without running into either Mule or BT territory, many players feel that the encounters are forced and leave little room for variability when players are moving back and forth between preppers across the landscape. The ease of escape in certain situations also makes many doubt the actual use of these enemies. By choosing the right path, certain regions can easily be bypassed, like the outskirts of the Mule camp behind the distribution center west of Lake Knot. Despite these misgivings about the role of these enemies and their effectiveness, it also plays on the vision of Death Stranding, and that is connection. Many roads help players bypass the BT regions altogether and leave these hostile encounters to cargo collection missions. Further vehicle upgrades also prevent any chance of destruction to vehicle capabilities, as mule spears can easily disable bikes if they can get the drop on you. Over time, it can also become apparent that straight running or riding a vehicle doesn't always work. Many BT territories can quickly become a nightmare if the bike is driven the wrong way and directly into the waiting arms of a BT. Running from mules also puts players at risk of tripping and damaging cargo, with each thrown spear remaining a threat to Sam's consciousness. These threats are another incentive for many to really know their path and build systems to outright avoid them. It also encourages players to prepare for such combat if they head on in on foot. Being properly armed and protected helps the player in the long run, giving them a better chance at survival and reducing any chance that the enemy can get to both Sam and the cargo. It is also because of these incentives that Death Stranding's combat provides a sweet balance to the normal minute-to-minute -minute gameplay mechanics of Death Stranding. Most of the calm deliveries are offset by the need to engage in combat or escape ethereal beings to survive. Often this can be seen as a spice to an otherwise non-assuming loop. This point rings especially true as this balance between deliveries and combat continues to shift as the story progresses. These enemies also become a major source of resources, as there are limits to what you can get from the various distribution centers around the map. Mules will often have some lost cargo and equipment left over from a long history of ambushing porters. These can be support equipment, like smoke decoys, or they can be several cases of materials which can be either donated to distribution centers or used in the upgrading and making of structures. The placement of these enemies along the road serves as a reminder to each player that there are methods to further boost their efficiency apart from traversal. In turn, it puts emphasis on the need to plan ahead and knowing how to properly traverse each region. While it can be seen as almost forceful in the opening area, it also serves as an addition to the whole mythos and the world of Death Stranding, and the addition of combat gives players more of a challenge in each delivery. We've already covered some of the larger game elements, which are the central delivery system and the enemies that patrol the world. In that discussion, there is a heavy focus on the cycle that players take while being in Death Stranding. Alternating between calm and tension is often unexpected and breathes a degree of life into the game. But it truly takes the story of Death Stranding to fully exemplify these traits, especially through the player's journey as Sam from Chapter 1 all the way to Chapter 15. One of Death Stranding's biggest strengths is the intrigue and mystery that it builds about the in-game world. The unique sci-fi setting of a cataclysmic event paired with the jaw-dropping landscape makes one an experience that places value in the exploration and the ambience of travel. The addition of the mysteries of the Death Stranding and Bridges adds to this experience by generating an all-encompassing mystery of these phenomenons and how they play into the player's experience into the world. While there is little lore to be found during each delivery, the game does make up for it through well-crafted and stunning cinematic cutscenes that help to build up the story and setting quickly for players. These cutscenes offer players an almost movie-like experience, which is especially felt in the last cutscene which lasts for about 2 hours. This is supported well by the diverse cast of actors who give powerful and emotional performances throughout the game, fleshing each character out in the small amount of screen time that they are given comparatively to Sam. But these focuses on characters are also the target of much of the criticism against the story. Some people argue that the characters often monologue too much, laying out too much too fast, 
and often echoing much of the same themes throughout the story. Furthermore, there are parts of the game that many players feel like take the absolute opposite direction, instead thrusting players into longer sections like Chapter 3, where it almost feels like there is no end in sight. These criticisms are valid to a certain extent. Much of the reason why such monologues exist is because they are necessary. Not just because Sam doesn't speak much in these cutscenes, but also by adding more lore to each character than they might get throughout the story. Pushing all this lore into interviews does not do anyone any good, and fleshing them out in key chapters in the story creates lasting impressions on the player, and defines each plot development they encounter. Each part of the story serves as another piece to the big question, what is the Death Stranding? Each individual thread makes up a larger web of questions about why any of the events of the game are even happening, and is the consistent plotline to push Sam and the player forward into the world. With every plot point, prepper, and technological development, Sam also finds himself increasingly ingrained into the future of the world, giving the initial slow burn of the game an intense lead-up and an explosive payoff. What Death Stranding does excel at is the pacing of the story, especially in its passive world-building in the early hours. Sam's position as a porter who is thrust into an empty and hollow world is felt very heavily in the opening hours, with only the silence and the ambiance of the world to accompany him on his deliveries. Many times it feels like there are large chunks of time where Sam learns nothing or sees nothing, only getting new specs of information through either prepper conversation or through collecting interviews. This isn't necessarily true, as with each prepper and each delivery, Sam learns more about the world, building connections and forging relationships with a diverse number of preppers across the landscape. This doesn't totally change the atmosphere of each delivery. In fact, it is almost comforting to know that a friendly face is on the other side when you make that delivery. This kind of passive world building and development is further accented by the asymmetric multiplayer experience that the game provides. As the Carol Network expands and Sam also uses more structures, the once hollow world slowly feels more alive. Instead of the pure ambiance of the world around you, players will be greeted by man-made structures, zip lines, systems, and roads. Many of these are made by other players sharing the same server as the player. As a result, it is equally as comforting to be accompanied by so many of the player base who are helping you on your deliveries or your journey through the story. Despite some of the shortcomings certain points of dialogue and the plot may have, Death Stranding's method of building up the story is perfectly unique and in line with its central themes. As Sam is reconnecting a very disconnected world, it is only logical that much of the slow burn is a result of that disconnection. As Sam continues his journey and reconnects preppers across the terrain, the plot builds up both passively and directly. That's why patience can sometimes be such a virtue with this game, as the opening hours may feel like such a slow burn, but the game ramps up in intensity as the journey continues, giving players the opportunity to not only learn more about the world, but actively participate in the world instead of being just some other porter. Kojima's model of a world where you are simultaneously disconnected and connected makes for a truly unique experience. This is an experience where you feel the world in full, and you start to fill up the world slowly with what it once was. Slowly going from the empty vastness of mountains to discovering pathways and forging your own path is a journey that isn't quite like most games. While the lore can be deep if the player decides to delve into interviews, the main storyline and world building itself is absolutely superb, with both the gameplay loop and enemies heavily supplementing that feeling of reconnection yet being alone at the same time. It is for these exact reasons that this game does become polarizing, because it is often compared to other AAA titles, framing it in a way that makes the game look like an unassuming and boring game. Yet at the same time, there is a reason why so many fans of the game like it. It isn't just because it's a Hideo Kojima game, but rather the different experience they get. The ambience, the intrigue, and all the elements work together to create what some argue could be a masterpiece. Whether you like the game or not, these elements are what makes the game different from the rest, and what makes the experience so distinctive in the minds of players. It might feel like taking a shot in the dark, but this is a game that is never quite the same as other games, and if you give it a shot, maybe you too can appreciate the beauty that this game provides. Thank you so much for watching this video. This started out as a passion project, an idea that was conceived in early 2022. It took over 60 gigabytes of raw footage that I had and countless rewrites and re-recordings to create what I hope to be the first of many videos just like this. If you have any thoughts about this game or just this video in general, please leave a comment as it will help me improve more or learn a thing or two about the topics I'm talking about. Again, thank you for watching and hopefully I'll be seeing you very soon.